Sean, can you hear me? Hi, Chris. Yep. Good. Great. I can see um, faders moving, so I think our audio is going through. So I think we're good. Um, welcome. Uh, how are you doing over there? Yeah, fine, thanks. Good. It's blowing a howling gale where I am. Um, it's not hot though, at least. Uh, so, welcome to episode three of Calico Live. Um, I'll just introduce myself as usual. Uh, my name is Chris Tompkins. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera. Um, so my role is to uh, champion user needs and uh, our com contributor community's needs as well. Um, I've been working in networking since 2000 and um, and always been interested in automation and uh, networking at scale. And that kind of led me into Kubernetes. And here we are. Uh, Sean, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sean Crampton, um, distinguished engineer at Tigera. Um, I look after our data planes, so the BPF data plane, open tables data plane, um, sort of our control plane function in um, in our per host um, per host agent called Felix, and a few other components. Um, must have been working on uh, Calico for about seven years now, something like that. I don't quite have the first commit, but. Um, I think that's my colleague, Neil, who might have that. Oh, that's interesting. I actually didn't know that. That's quite interesting. Yeah, you've been working on Kubernetes since before I knew what it was, I would I would suspect. Uh, so. I, I think, well, I've been, wor been working on Calico since before there was Kubernetes. Um, oh, of so course, we, yes. Because the ancient started, history I'm not so familiar with. Yeah, we, we started as an OpenStack integration and we were written in Python. Uh, right. And that was a very long time ago. But, yeah, um, we should do a separate that, session that is, about that. That one is day. still part of the product, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you can still run Calico for OpenStack; it still works. Yeah, that's pretty cool, actually. It's good to show the the long tail and the fact that it's still supported um, to this day. Uh, that's cool. Um, so, what is Calico Live? Well, um, by now, so hopefully, we've got a few people who've been along before. But Calico Live's um, an occasional, informal live video stream series, and it's meant to be a relaxing opportunity for us to check in in a, a, a learn about technologies uh, that we're interested in together but in a in a slightly more relaxed and uh, different format um we're currently focusing on ebpf and uh, we're saying adventures with the ebpf data plane so just um knowledge sharing real uh, real life learning that kind of thing um I published an agenda but as we saw in last week's session the agenda uh, occasionally we we, we will take our time and, and not get to all of it, which is what happened last week, um, because we were so fascinating about the topics we were in, we just uh, lost track of time. Um, so with that said, I must remember, as I always am trying to to say that um, the priority isn't to get through the material on the sheet of paper, the, the priority is for us to um, engage with the community. So anyone who is watching who would like to uh, present a question, easy or difficult, uh, anything is totally fine. And it, if even if it's off topic, um, as long as it's not miles off topic, we, we're happy to pick it up and we can always put things back to, to a different day uh, if that works best. So generally we'll cover the high level first and then dig into the detail, but this week's gonna be a bit more technical because we're covering off the technical stuff that we, or that I uh, failed to get to at the end of last week's session. So with that, I think I'll just dive straight in. Um, so I'll share a browser window with you. Um, where is that? Let's try that. Oop, that has not worked. One second. Hmm, interesting. I've got a problem sharing my browser. One moment. Ah, here it is. Yes, there we are. Brilliant. So yeah, just quickly, uh, I can you can see that, can't you, Sean? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So what this is, uh, I showed this diagram last week, so I won't dwell on it too long. But this is, um, I'll zoom in in a moment so, so you can catch all the detail. But this is a diagram of, oops, this is a diagram of the um, lab that I've built for us. Uh, so at the top we have my workstation out on the internet. The IP has changed because I first built this lab a few weeks ago, and um, my public IP is not is not permanent. Um, Likewise, there's an internet cloud, and then likewise, there's a GCP load balancer because we're hosting a, a Kubernetes cluster in GCP. So that IP too has changed, but conceptually, the IPs have changed, but nothing else has. 
Um, and then you can see there's a five node uh, Kubernetes cluster running in GCP. Uh, it's not a Google Kubernetes engine, it's GCP nodes um, uh, built with QADM. And on those five nodes, there's a master node, and then there's only a single workload in the default namespace, which is called Echo Server. And uh, you can see there in a kind of fetching pinky purpley color, uh, the actual flow of um, client traffic to a service on that Echo Server. Um, it's an eBPF cluster, which probably goes without saying, but I should, should say it. Um, so you can see I've tried to highlight that you've got eBPF running on each node and the eBPF maps are shown there as well. Uh, it's also got direct server, to, direct server return turned on. Um, so you can see that the, the reply does not go via uh, the GCP load balancer. It goes straight to the client and we'll actually see that today when we, when we capture the flow um, and examine it. So that's cool. Um, just thinking if there's anything else I should say about that. So the main reason for having a single uh, service pod serving serving uh, the the service is uh, so that we can see a predictable flow that we can that we can analyze more easily. But obviously, I could I could spread that out and put more uh, more instances in place if I wanted to. Um, so if I just zoom in, in case anyone can't read that uh, and just scroll down, uh, you can see you've got TCP to the load balancer. Uh, then from there, TCP to a node port, which is, that's just how um, uh, um, Kubernetes works. And from there, uh, that, could, that could go to any of the, uh, any of the five nodes. Uh, and then from there to a VXLAN tunnel that takes us to the node that has the actual service pod and then direct server return. Um, just covering that off briefly, I don't think I've missed anything, have I, Sean? I think so. Um... I guess I, I did have a, um, I was just wondering if the GCP load balancer does go via node ports, but um, if you've checked that, then that's that's fine. Um, There's yeah. different, different types of load balancer in the different clouds. I've sort of forgotten which, uh, which ones do what. But, yes, um, it does work this way because um, we'll actually capture the flow in a bit, and we'll, I think we'll see all of it. But um, this is a good opportunity to talk right. about the, about the port numbers actually. So you can see the destination port on the load balancer is eight eight three eight five, um, and then that's hitting thirty eight three eight um, is actually the node port. Um, so you'll actually see that we we can actually I've I've curled that node port when I was when I was testing for the blog. So yeah, that that is definitely how it works. Um, and then you can see the actual echo server pod is answering on 8080. Um, I tried to choose interesting port numbers to make it easier to grep the logs and see, you know, if, yeah. you, if you choose interesting port numbers, you can be fairly confident you can grep them more easily. That's what 20 years of experience has taught me. So with the exception of the echo server answering on 8080, uh, we're good. I'm drinking ginger beer here, which is extremely unwise because it makes me cough. So I just realized that's a very bad choice, but we'll see how we manage. All right, so let's jump across. Um, I'll move that out of the way, and we should be able to. Oops. Should be able to jump to the actual setup. Give me a second. Um, my shared account. Okay, I've put our video kind of behind the camera. Um, that's probably the largest font size I can manage that will be uh, readable for me, but it should be readable for you, hopefully, just about. I know you, the, 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 way, the way we're sharing screens is a bit um, challenging for you, but uh, you can read that. Uh, yeah, just about. Great. Might okay. have to lean in. Uh, you're, it'll be mostly me talking in any way, and uh, you're offering insights, so I think we're, we're fine. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was to show that IP sets point that I that I made. So let me just find my doc about that um, in case I need it. Probably don't actually, but yeah. So um, so we have uh, if we look at our nodes first of all. There's our five nodes uh, that I just I showed in the diagram. They have internal IPs and external IPs. We'll SSH to the nodes in due course, but we don't need to yet. And then in terms of pods, um, in the default namespace, we can see that there's just this one echo server running. Um, and oops, if 
we look at all namespaces, we can see that we have Calico Node and um, Core DNS and other parts. And this is, was deployed with the Tiger Air operator. Um, so at the moment, if we have a quick look at the IP sets, there is no network policy in place yet. Um, so I'll just copy this command from here. Uh, is that going to work without any adaptation? Yes, I think it will. Let's try. So I briefly said what this command did, but on the assumption that we may have people who didn't watch last week, um, this command here is just a funky way of getting the information we need quickly. Uh, it runs a for loop. It gets the name of all the Calico node pods across which are in the Calico system namespace. Um, it grabs out those Calico node pods and grabs the uh, host names. Then it prints the host name. So then it iterates over a loop. It prints the host name uh, and then uh, uses um, Calico node or Calico BPF uh, to show the IP sets to dump them out. And then it grabs out uh, inverse grabs uh, some information that's just uh, logging detail that we won't, don't want to see. I won't go into what Calico BPF is. We've talked about that before. So if anyone's not familiar, then um, it's probably best to go back uh, to, to last week's session and catch up with this one later. Um, so you can see that the, there's no IP sets on any of the nodes, which makes sense because there's no policy. Um, but I have, um, I have some policy here. And this is just a simple policy that says, allow any ingress um, from the IP allow set, network set, and then deny everything else. So I'm going to add my IP and intentionally not yours up here. But before I do that, I need to know what it is. Um, is that going to work? Let's find out. Yeah. Oh, no. I forgot the URL. OK, I'll just uh, find out what my IP is over here. There's a great URL you can you can curl that just gives you your own IP and nothing else. Um, I forget what it is. My, it's like my IP dot check IP, whatever. My IP is that right now. So um, let's switch that in here. Okay, so if I apply that policy, is if, if you tried to do what you just did back in the IP tables data plane, you wouldn't be seeing your IP as the source. You would see the intermediate node, which would confuse things. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, um, that's right. So source IP preservation is one of the advantages of this data plane, um, which is extremely helpful. I usually say it's helpful for uh, logging, auditing, and denial of service, and regional restrictions. Are there any other use cases you can think of? I mean, just in general, with your with your policy, um, the the policy just makes more sense. It's more it's more intuitive because um, you want to block or allow traffic from a particular source IP, and you don't have to worry about the fact that the Kubernetes um, data plane has snatted your traffic on the way in. And, and removed that information. Yeah, uh, we'll actually see in a uh, in a few demos. You know, in in twenty minutes time or so, we'll actually see the flow as it goes through the whole cluster and see where the IP, uh, and talk through where the IPs are, are being preserved and so on. So um, that we'll see it quite clearly then. Um, so let me just apply that policy quickly. Um, Uh, what am I missing there? Um, I think you've used the enterprise Calico Cuttle. Oh, one. good I point. Think. Yeah, well done. I just moved. Um, I think I have both in here, hopefully. Yeah, there it is. Uh, right. Let's fix that. So I suppose um, you could elaborate on the fact that there are actually two while while I do this, Sean. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the the Calico Enterprise has a 
an extended data model with more um, uh, a few more um, resources and so on in it for, for controlling the enterprise features. Um, so yeah, you have a different version of Calico Cuttle if you're using the, the enterprise product. And obviously Chris uh, switches between the two quite a lot for his role. Yeah, um, it's good that you figured that out as quickly as you did. It would have taken me a minute or two longer, probably. And that would have been a nice sweaty minute. Um, so that's good. Right, I'm using the right Calico Cuttle now. So um... that, so as as it happens, one thing that just, um, just went in to Calico Cuttle a couple of days ago was a, a version check on the server because it's always been the case that you could run you know a new version of calico cuttle on an old server or an old calico cuttle on a new server and it would do its best but we didn't sort of police that you were using the right version and then um, if you used an old version you could read the data but it would ignore the new fields and then you, you would have problems if you tried to round trip data so um, we've actually put in a, a version check there, and um, I just saw that go in a couple of days ago. That's great. I actually I was actually pushing for that. I didn't realize that had happened. I think that's a great idea um, to avoid these. We we of... listen to our dev advocacy team <laughs> as well. You should. Um, okay, so you can see um, since uh, Sean instantly knew what the problem was, that's fixed. Uh, the policy is applied. Um, so now, if we look at our IP sets again uh, by running that for loop again, um, you can see that the one of the nodes knows about the IP set. Um, and then if I quickly apply some other resources, so what I'm doing now is putting some other resources in the uh, default namespace. Um, you will see that previously only one uh, node knew about the IP set. And now that there are more workloads in, um, in the default namespace, which I'm showing here, you can see that more nodes know about this. Now, I don't want to labor this point. Actually, we, as usual, we're taking longer than I thought we would. So um, I don't, I want to get onto other things. So, um, but really briefly, Sean, did you want to just elaborate on where that decision process is, is happening in the, in uh, within Calico? Yeah. Um, so when you, when you apply policy, um, the way Calico works is it takes all of the policy that you put into Kubernetes all of the policy that you supply as Calico network policies, and it converts them all into our sort of internal representation, which sort of covers covers all of those. Um, and then Felix, which is the daemon that runs on each on each node in a daemon set called Calico node, um, will load all of that policy. It watches the data store to make sure it has the up to date information. Um, and it calculates what policy is active on the local node. So it matches the policy against the local um, uh, set of pods that are on that particular node. And it will only render the policy um, that is actually active on a particular node, um, like on that node. So if you, if you have an IP set that is used uh, well, an IP set represents a selector in your policy, you know, maybe a, a pod selector in your Kubernetes policy. Um, it will only render that IP set to the data plane if it's used by a policy that is used by a pod on the local on the local host. Yeah. How, clo um, how close to right. how close to instant is that? Because I've never seen it. You know, I've, I've very quickly run commands as I just did then. and. It, it, it always it's always there it's always caught up uh, I, uh, obviously in, it can't be instant but it, it seems to be pretty quick in in a small cluster like that um the latency in the api server is quite small so you're talking you know 100 milliseconds or something and then the latency for it to get through felix's calculation is usually just a couple of milliseconds um and then programming the data plane again it, it's on the order of milliseconds for for a very small cluster if you have a very large cluster um, in in IP tables mode, um, if you if you're in a very large cluster and Cube Proxy has you know ten thousand rules for implementing all the services, then IP tables can get quite slow and take a second or two to to update as as the number of services grows and and you know extreme uh, extreme scale, it can take you know ten seconds or more to to update IP tables. 
Um, so that's one of the advantages of, of the BPF data plane is we decouple from that IP tables kernel API, which has has some slowness in it. Nice. Um, yeah, makes sense. And there are other there are other moves afoot. So um, IP tables is steadily being replaced by NF tables inside the kernel, mm -hmm. and newer distros use that instead. And the API that is used there is more efficient. So this problem where like cube proxy having lots of rules slows down other things is kind of should go away once that all flows through and once we can take advantage of that. Yeah, makes sense. Um, on, on that side. Cool. Okay, so what I wanted to go on to now was to, to actually see the flow like I've been promising for a while um, using Calico, Calico BPF. So to make this easier, um, as you can see here, I'm using two environment variables to, um, to capture what I care about. So this is my public IP and this is the port that the um, that the service is listening to on the GCP load balancer specifically. Uh, if you recall, that's not the node port. Um, port. Um, it's it's the GCP load balancer. Uh, and then the actual service pod is on 8080. So if I just set those two environment variables, um, and then I should be able to run this. And so this is another for loop, and, and, and it's doing the same trick as before. It's grabbing out all the, the Calico nodes, and then it's running Calico BPF. But this time, it's dumping out the contract table. Um, then it's uh, filtering out some stud out, or actually, it's redirecting some stud air to stud out um, to, to basically unify all the output from the command in one place. And then it's grabbing that for the IP that we care about and the interesting port that we care about. So we shouldn't see anything, although I did hit the port myself about 25 minutes ago to check that it was up, that should have, I believe, aged out by now. And that's important because I really didn't want to clutter. I made the mistake of cluttering the view once. So that's great. So we're seeing that there's no existing flow, um, no yeah. record of the existing flow. Now, I've made the mistake of hitting it with Chrome before, and that seem to cause more than one flow because Chrome was doing whatever pre-caching or other magic it does. So I'm not going to hit it with yeah. Chrome. I'm going to hit it with curl. So just for the for the context, the BPF programs have a have a map which Chris is um, yes, well done. Chris is dumping here that um, it it has an entry for each uh, each connection that we're aware of, and if you have multiple nodes involved in a in a flow because it's coming in on one node and then we're load balancing it to another um you should see flows on both yes that's exactly um, it and then uh, and, yeah and because of that the node that actually has the service pod <coughs> seem to have record of of both flows and it all becomes a bit harder to 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 parse so i'm trying to make it as clean as possible and um, before we move on actually i should remind myself to to say um we, we've got several people watching i can see so um just to remind people that we're totally cool with taking questions and it doesn't have to be the, mo the world's most advanced question or, or, any, or, or, or you know, any question is absolutely fine. So uh, chip in if you have any questions and we're, ha we're happy to be, to be um, redirected. So that's interesting. Oh, that's because I'm <laughs> sorry. I, you, <laughs> I'm trying to hit my own IP here. Uh, let me try that again with added. Uh, that is the correct one there. So just to just to actually show, I, I think this is worth just taking a small side step actually, because you were saying was it a node port? So I can show that it is because you see how. So this is a load balancer. Um, and you can see there that you've got the um, external IP and the cluster IP. But here, this 3279, if I just grab that quickly, actually, actually we'll, do it, we'll do it after so it doesn't clog the logs, I've just realized. So let's, let's do the basic case and then I'll show you that afterwards if we have time. So if I curl that now um, and I try this again with the external IP. So yeah, I think every, every load balancer service does get a node port. Chris, it's just... Um, the load, if if your network supports it, the load balancer is allowed to skip the um, skip the node port and go directly to the pod. Is so it? Kind of, ah, it, interesting. It depends what type of cluster you've got and exactly how it's 
configured. So if you're right, uh, and 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 what the capabilities of the load balancer are, but I, I know some of the clouds do. Well, that's do interesting. Do that. We might be able where, to see where which the fabric is yeah. aware of the pod IP. They can they can do that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's worth drilling into for a second. So in a second, we'll hopefully from the logs, we might actually be able to answer that question ourselves. But yeah, um, a load balancer is a superset of cluster IP, isn't it? So so a load balancer has a cluster IP, and then a, a, right. a cluster IP in turn is a superset of a node port. Hence, no, you know. it's the other way around. So uh, a, a node port is a superset of a cluster IP. So cluster IP okay. is your most basic, and then you can add a node port on, but you still get the cluster IP, and then you can you can add a load balancer on top of that. Gotcha. That's why you're on this call. Um, <laughs> thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm going to go and reread that after this because I thought I had that clear in my head, but it appears I do not. Um, so here we go. So if I call that now, um, we can see request served by Echo Server, blah, um, and so on. Uh, so now if we go straight back to the for loop, we can see, and we've only hit it once, we should get a nice clean view of uh, traffic. There it is. So there are two nodes involved here. So let's um, just quickly figure out which one actually has the Echo Server. So infra zero is the one that has infra zero, and that is in turn looking in the Calico system. Namespace, it's this node. So the node ending 7T is the one that has, I'm just checking my facts on that. 7T is in for zero. And yeah, so 7T is the node that actually has the um, workload, which means that the other one will be the, uh, the node that's handling the service in this case. Okay, so let's scroll back up because it's already timed out. Actually, Sean, that's an interesting question that maybe I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but I've noticed this timeout quicker and slower in the past. Like, that seems to have timed out very quickly this time, but I'm sure I've seen it hang around for a few minutes before. Is there any factor where that would be a thing? Or um, or is that me? So uh, we we do our contract cleanup um, so that the, the flows will hang around until Felix cleans them up. So Felix does a periodic garbage collection of the flows. Um, and if if the flow is kind of finished then we give it a we give it a grace period to to allow any um you know thin packets to be uh resent or whatever and then we uh then we clean them up interesting um the the timer for felix i think it does it every 10 seconds it does a scan of the the contract map um and that that's something we'd like to improve and make it a bit more dynamic so it doesn't uh doesn't do that poll every 10 seconds when you know it's not needed on your system clearly it could it could leave things around for a lot longer mm -hmm. um but yeah it's uh it's spotted that the connection is is closed by the look of it um because yeah. the client sent a fin packet and then the timeout is fairly short after that I can't yeah remember so, exactly so, what. so that's really i mean it's really good that it's cleaned up that quickly i feel like i've seen I feel like I've seen slower behavior, but it could be that I'm uh, that either I did something wrong or um, or that I'm missing memory, frankly. So I, I, it, let's not. It, it'll depend on exactly what state the connection's in, how mm. long it persists. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if the client or the server go away and they don't send a fin, then it's a much longer timeout yeah, because, sense, yeah. from our point of view, it looks like the connection is still still up. So I, I really like this view. It took me a little bit to, to parse it when I first looked at it. Um, but you can see here that we have my public IP at home. Um, we have my ephemeral high order port. That I'm, you know, this is just a randomly chosen, um, pseudo randomly chosen uh, high order port that, you know, that's, that's how source ports work in TCP. We have the uh, GCP um, load balancer and the port on the load balancer. And then we have that mapping actually, this is a single contract key and uh, 
then there's a reverse key mapping. Um, by the way, uh, Sean, obviously, this is my understanding, have, having dived into it, but uh, you're closer to this stuff. So if I, if, if I speak out of turn, then feel free to, to correct me. Um, and then we can see this is the IP of the, uh, let me get my facts straight. That's the IP, yeah, that is the IP of the pod, yeah. That's the IP of the pod, and there's the real, um, the real port of the service pod. The other interesting thing we can see here is the tunnel IPs of the VXLAN tunnel. Um, so that, that is the node IP, and that is the node IP of the VXLAN tunnel uh, that is carrying the traffic from this node, which is the ingress node hosting the service, and this node, which happens to have the service pod in this scenario. Um, what other interesting data jumps out of you there? Anything else that you think we should point out? Yeah, I mean, so mm -hmm. as you say, there's two entries. Um, so if um, uh, if there's if the packet is not matted, so if or if the packet is not kind of um, yeah, I guess not matted, um, and it's just a very simple flow. We only have one entry um, that we um, that we store. And that would have all the information, but because this packet has been manipulated on the way through, um, we need to be able to look at the information um, in both directions. So we might have a packet going, you know, from your client to uh, to the pod, or we might have a, a packet going in the reverse reverse, reverse direction from your pod, um, and we need to be able to do a lookup on the five tuple of those packets, but the five tuple of those two sets of packets differ, um, like in that they're, they're not even like the flipped version of each other because there's NAT involved. So we end up with two entries. Um, the way we happen to implement it is the forward entry is the first one that got dumped there. Um, so that's the entry in the in the like forward direction of client to pod and what's what's telling you what's telling you that from it is that the entry type um i think just because it's uh, because that one um one of the entries there is rev key so um one of one of the entries that we store in the forward direction is the key of the reverse entry yes so when calico when calico's bpf program looks up a looks up in contract and it gets a forward entry it knows it's a forward entry because it um it's type says that uh so type type one in that case i guess um it obviously it's, it's just done numerically here but type one will be forward entry and that tells us to interpret the value as the reverse key so we take that reverse key and we do a second lookup in the contract table um, so it's a little bit slower when we have to process things in that direction because um, we do that second lookup. Um, but then we look up the reverse key. And as you can see, the reverse key has a lot more information in it. So we don't we don't store very much in the forward key. It's just like a pointer to the to the reverse key where we store all the interesting things about what to do with this packet. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a simple flow where it was just a pod IP to a pod IP, then you would just have one key and it would have all the information in 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 that one key so the manipulation um, here the only the, it's only a dnat that's happening though isn't it there's no snat here um yeah so on the on the node where the packet enters the cluster which is this guy um all we do is we um we encapsulate the packet in a vxlan packet and then we send that vxlan packet to the chosen backing node um so we don't do any dnat at that point right um that's how we preserve the source ip we just we preserve the packet exactly as it is we forward it on to yeah, the backing yeah, node yeah i got confused the actually node knows if i get a vxlan packet that looks like this i should do a secondary load balance on it limited to my local pods which will you know, nine times out of 10, that will pick the same pod because you only have one pod on your node anyway. But it's kind of irrelevant. Um, mm -hmm. 
So it picks one of its backing pods that's local, um, and then the DNAT all happens on the uh, on the node with the backing pod. So the the node with the backing pod will have the DNAT information about which which uh, backing pod was chosen, um, and that's kind of the final answer. The, right. It's possible that the ingress node also records a decision there, but that's actually ignored because we don't do the DNAT on the ingress node. So. Um, yeah, I'm just seeing if I can see. There's basically the contract entry has a has two sections to it, so A to B and B to A. So just arbitrary names for the two legs of the connection, so one direction and the other direction. Yeah. Um, uh, at start of day, when the connection's being established, we record the sequence numbers of the packets, so we can check that the TCP state machine gets initialized correctly and and uh, the connection gets um, uh, yeah we don't we don't allow packets that um, try to like spoof their way into a, a handshake and stuff mm -hmm. um, and we track you know have we seen the sin packet have we seen the app packet um, you know are we generally kind of happy with the flow like has it passed past all of our our checks that we do for security reasons, like um, reverse path filtering checks and things like that. Yeah, the only one that's not obvious to me here, actually, in the flags, uh, obviously, sin, ack, fin, reset, whitelisted, those all make sense to me. The only one that's not obvious to me is opener. Um, so I think we just track, um, we, we track which direction we first saw the packet in. Um, Right. So that in this case is the B to A direction, and the name the names of those two are, are arbitrary. It's to do with the um, uh, like which direction is A to B and which direction is B to A. Actually, depends on the numeric value of the IP address. So right. um, it's kind of backwards to what you might you might think. You might you might think we would have you know. Uh, a to B being the like client to server and B to A being server to client, mm -hmm. but it can get flipped depending on what the what the IP addresses are. That's so, really in that's um, a really interesting actually. Um, that, that's why they have a silly name. Yeah, actually, you know, uh, as you know, this is the, the material we're going through here the, is is closely related to the blog post that that I um, that I published uh, about um, the EBPF deep dive. But the reason I used this material was I knew that this we that we go into we find interesting stuff here that, that I didn't cover in the blog. So I may actually go back and retrospectively add a link to this conversation to that blog post because I think this is, it was quite a detailed blog post that people found useful there, but I think this is a step further um, of detail that, that I didn't capture. Um, so that's great, thanks Sean. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else here that jumps out. Um, the interface, interface indexes, I don't think we can see we don't really have a, a way to look up what those interfaces indexes are, do we? Um, so those those are Linux interface indexes, right. or, or zero means um, means like not not tracked, basically. Right. Um, so those are used for um, detecting if the routing changes on the node. So if um, we we record what interfaces the routing send like what interface it arrived the packet arrived at and what interface it left at as as interface ids um so those are linux interface ids that you can see with um a command like ip link or something like that cool okay um and then basically if nothing changes so we get a new we get a new packet we try to route it um and the source matches what we were expecting, and the desk matches what we were expecting. Then um, we sort of fast path that packet, and we say, okay, nothing's changed. The routing all agrees. Um, like we've already checked that that interface is the right interface for this packet, so we let it let it through. Um, if the packet, if the flow moves to a different interface, so like let's say you had two pods and. Um, you know, we suddenly start seeing this TCP session um, has moved from this pod to that pod. Then the the interface index check will spot that this pod is trying to spoof that pod. For example, um, that's that's one thing it does. And then the the other thing it does is 
um, if you say you have like two network facing interfaces like you've got ETH0 and ETH1 and your um, your routing changes like maybe there's a failover in your network and the the connection should move from ETH0 to ETH1 mm -hmm. then we'll spot that the packets are suddenly going out of a different interface or arriving at a different interface and we'll repeat the RPF check to verify that's all legit nice. and it, it was meant to, meant to happen um, and then we'll let we'll update the value that we cache in the uh, in the um, the contract entry there. Great. Um, there's also one more thing that we use that for. So mm -hmm. um, if you're in an in, if you're in a um, if you're in an environment like EKS where they have a kind of highly customized routing table, mm -hmm. um, EKS is a platform that we really want to support. Um, it's a key one for for a lot of our users and, and customers. Um, so in there, we use it to um, to kind of work around the fact that their routing table is more complicated than we can kind of natively handle in in the BPF data plane. Gotcha. Cool. Um, that's really interesting. And uh, Nathan, uh, someone watching along, Nathan said um, he he definitely wants me to go back and add this to the blog. So I will do. Um, uh, Further down the line, I may actually do a, a, an even more detailed blog, but for now, I'll just link this data pack. Um, all right, last thing I want to ask about this before we move on, because we've got uh, otherwise we'll run out of time as usual. Um, we always seem to we always seem to, to to find a lot of interesting detail to uncover. Is uh, if I wanted to know about these flags, NP forward and um, X local, and these, is the best thing just to grab the source code, um, or is there some table somewhere that tells me what these are? Um. So I I think you'd probably have to look at the source code. So we haven't thoroughly documented this tool. Um, it was a tool that we built for internal diagnosis of you know understanding the data plane, so we yeah. can we can build it basically. Um, I think I can tell you what what those mean. So NP forward means node port forward. So it's a flag to say this this is a a node port forwarded um, uh, flow. Which we use for certain special cases. I think I think that's what that means. Uh, X local. Um, not sure off the top of my head. Just to go to go hyper nerd for a second. Um, I I get frustrated with the fact that with two letter, three letter, yeah, two letter and three letter acronyms. With the the namespace being a network engineer, the namespace is so heavily overloaded that NP yeah. could be <laughs> could be any one of a hundred things, right? Um, I think all tech uh, all tech acronyms should from now this from this point on be you know four or five letters. Otherwise, you know MP could be network policy, it could be node port, it could be all kinds of things. Um, not policed. So yeah. Anyway, um, I don't think I'm going to win that. Yeah, I, I might even be wrong, but I think I think that's what it is. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So let's dig into what we can achieve with TC then. Um, so the next thing I wanted to go into was uh, TC, and I thought it's quite interesting seeing what we can do here. So. Um, Really, what 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 we want to do, or what we're interested in doing, so so we have spoken about this both verbally and in blogs before. So I don't want to go into too much detail about what TC is, but essentially um, uh, TC allows us to. Sorry, I just typed man TC by the way to get that um, to show or manipulate the settings for traffic control in Linux. And um, one way that that can be useful when you're looking at your eBPF um, based Calico cluster is to see packet drops and so on. Um, so if we wanted to see, if we go back to that network diagram just for a sec. Um, yeah, that works. I should have done it this way first time. Okay, so, um, so, when I was when I was uh, deep diving and learning about uh, or, or deep, deepening my own understanding of this, uh, I was thinking about where where does the packet actually get dropped? So so at the moment we have this network policy in place that anyone who's been on the call since the start will know that that it will only allow my external IP to to uh, that GCP service. And I was thinking about where that is actually implemented. Um, it's not implemented in the GCP cloud because the the network policy exists on the nodes and the naive, immediate thinking, naive thing would be you think, okay, well, you'd want to filter on that interface coming in there. Um, but the reality is that then that would mean that every node would need more information stored in its IP sets than is strictly necessary. 
Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, which is why um, when that network policy filters my traffic, um, it happens at the TC hook right next to the pod. Is that correct? Uh, it, it, that's true for the type of policy um, that you're using there. Yes. Yeah, sure. So I should have made that clarification. When, when you apply when you apply policy to a pod, yes, we apply we apply that policy on the um, on the node where the pod is. So the traffic has to get there before um, before um, it will be dropped. Great. So um, which does, does mean that you you've got that contract state that's being set up on the two nodes before it reaches the the policy is a bit unfortunate. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't um, it? Um, so it's kind of up, you win in one area and lose in another. And just taking away these other services, we don't need them anymore, so I'm just de decluttering quickly. Um, but what we're going to do quickly is uh, I'm going to show you how, show people how they can find uh, where, which interface they should be interested in running TC on. Um, and essentially, we just need to know, if, well, the first thing we need to know is what node is uh, is that echo server running on? There's many ways we could figure this out. Um, the simplest, probably the simplest way is simply to check uh, with kubectl, so we'll do that. So um, if we do get pods and we don't specify the namespace, the only thing in the, in the default namespace is the pod we're interested in. And if we do output wide, then we'll get um, the name of the node which uh, is running the echo server. So the next thing we need to do is to find out more about that node. And we can see it's in for zero. But if we again, if we specify wide, um, there's the public IP. Now I've got the SSH keys installed already to allow me to SSH directly to the nodes. And um, that is the node that we uh, the node that we care about. So now we're on we're on the node that is uh, hosting that pod. Um, so we can see that if we look at the IP addresses, we can see that. Well, actually, I've kind of spoiled my own thing there. Yeah, there we go. Um, so if we have a quick look at the routing table using Netstat. So first of all, I'm just installing Net Network Tools to allow me to use Netstat. Um, we look at netstat minus nr we can see here are I think the, the command you're looking for is ip space root well i mean you could do it that way yeah you could do it that way you know i like my way <laughs> i think it's it's what command have you been using for the last 15 years and it's it's wired into you um so well netstat minus nr does the same thing so here we go so these are the two why are there two so let's have a look. So 2265 and 2266. Now I forgot to check before we SSH onto this box, which one. So it's 2266 is the IP of uh, the Echo server. You might have a, um, a core DNS pod or yeah, something like something that. Yeah, something in one of the other namespaces. Yeah, exactly. I, I realized that after I said it. Um, yeah, so if we go back in here and we use, uh, you know, we could use IP root, I suppose. Um, I find, oh, oh. I find the tabulation nicer on that stat. There you go, it's more readable. Um, so it's 2266. We can see that it's a slash 32 mask, and there's the Kali interface that actually has. Oh, yeah, slash 32 written 255, 255. Yeah, whatever, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you can't, you can't switch between them quickly. Oh, that's, that's disappointing, sure. Um, right, let's ditch the trash talking, I think. Um, so. Yeah, so if we jump on here and we just quickly, uh, I do not remember the, the syntax of this command. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's this. So, oh yeah, it's different. Yeah, I'm just realizing there's a better. That's a better way to do this. I shouldn't. Be, I shouldn't be running TC on the. I think I actually could run TC on the Kubernetes node, but it's better to to do it here, isn't it? Um, so what I need to do is I need to get the Calico node name that's associated with Infra Zero. I have a feeling there's a better way to do this, a smoother way to do this, but this is what I'm going to do. So there's Infra Zero. Oh, hold on. 
if you have PC installed, you can you can just run it on the host. Um, I feel like Calico Node has mm -hmm. PC has TC inside it because um, we we use that binary as part of the BPF data plane. We, we use it to install our yes. um, BPF programs. Yeah, I feel like there was a reason I did it this way. What, that when I was why am I not seeing oh, in for zero? There we are. So that's the Calico Node we care about. So we want. That, and then we want the Calico node that we care about, which is that one. Then we want to pass in the TC command, and finally the Kali interface name that we care about. Now we can see that there's the um, class uh, QDisk that we've talked about before. And we can see five packets dropped, which is interesting because it means someone's tried to hit this since it's been up um, and been blocked. Um, so, Sean, did you want did you want to try and hit that quickly? Um, you, yeah, if I just hit it myself first of all, you see that when it succeeds for me, it makes no difference to the drop count because it's succeeding. But if you try and hit it, you need to tell me the uh, yeah, so the it's, idea. yeah, so it's um, curl thirty five one nine two. 73170 and the port is 8385 73170 yeah that's right and the port was 88385 eight, so you should get no response right I'm um, getting no response excellent good uh, so if I run that command again we should see there we are the drop count is incremented so you so you're being blocked by the policy so just to go over what we're doing again, um, we're basically uh, running TC on the Calico node on the Kubernetes node, which uh, which is hosting the destination pod, um, and we're we're running uh, we're showing the showing the QDisk counts counters on the interface facing the pod. Um, now, as and you, the key thing, yeah. mm -hmm. the key thing that you've got on your TC command there um, is the dash s flag before mm -hmm. anything else. Um, so TC is very the TC command is really particular. You have to put any flags before your sort of main command, which is quite annoying. Um, but dash s means show statistics. So that shows the drop count. So yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. I, I, I've been doing that for a while and I, I kind of almost don't see it anymore. I actually just, as you were saying about the, the, being particular about the syntax, I remember when I first started dealing with Kubernetes, I found this syntax incredibly funky and confusing. Well, I, I've kind of got used to it nowadays, but but yeah, you, it is quite particular. Yeah. So, so is there any other useful information we're seeing here? Um, and the answer is fine if the answer is no, because at the end of the day, as you said, as, as you said, this, you know, the objective here is not necessarily to provide a usable, uh, or, or, you know, a, a streamlined tool um, for the end user. It's more of a debugging tool than anything else. Uh, but is there anything else of interest right. to you here? I would say not too much in there. Um, so the the nice thing about that TC command is it's a very quick way to get the count of dropped packets. If you if you're just trying to see like. Are we dropping packets for some reason? Um, and it, you know, it's kind of like if you're in IP tables and you pass dash C, you could see how many packets were dropped. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, it's quite a crude tool that only um, it only shows you like the count of drop, doesn't tell you what rule or why they were dropped. Um, but um, I guess the other thing that command is showing is it is showing your queue disks, so your queuing disciplines that are attached to that interface. Um, so those can be interesting in and of themselves, um, but the one that we care about is that class act queue disk, which is the special queue disk that we add just to attach a BPF program to, um, and then whatever else you have in that tree. So the the no queue queue disk, um, which I think is just a no op doesn't queue anything queue disk, um, is the sort of main queue disk of uh, the VETH device that you you ran that command on. Um, so you might see other ones there, like you might see one that has a FIFO in it. So that would be a one that first in, first out, queues up packets and then releases them 
in order, that kind of thing, or you yeah. might have a tree that's more complicated. Um, but the class act one is the one that has the BPF uh, program attached. So when I so when i um, when I was when I'm first learning about an environment with a lot, I always end up doing things like this. Um, is do you know if this is there any kind of production load that I should be cautious of on a, on a production cluster, or, or is does this look like? I mean, obviously this is not a production cluster, which is why I'm happy to do it now, but. I, I don't think there's any load from running TC to, to get the stats there. I think that's very, uh, very light. Uh, one other thing you can do with TC, so not, not this specific command, but you can see the BPF programs with TC as well. So you can check if they're actually installed on the, on the device. So if you do, instead of TC QDisk show, yeah. if you do TC uh, filter show, Dev, Kali, whatever it was, um, and then you have to type space ingress or egress um, for a slightly annoying reason. It doesn't if you don't if you don't tell it to show the ingress one or the egress one, mm -hmm. it doesn't show any. It just gives you no output. So oh, I think that's, that's what you yeah, need to yeah, nice. I, yeah. Commands that fail that fail silently are another another fun one, aren't they? Uh, this is interesting. But, I've not actually seen this before. Um, which, so, by, yeah, by the way, I should be saying really that we can ignore this line of debugging that is always there. Um, it just kind of clutters. Uh, so what am I looking at here, Sean? So that that is showing you one of the filters that is attached to the QDisk. So um, let me see if I can kind of pause it. Um, so I, I think where it says like uh, the I, I was seeing if there was like an ID that you can relate back I, to. ID, ID 179. So that that is the ID of the BPF program, which is useful. But I was just trying to see if I could um, see any IDs that go from the QDisk to this to show like what QDisk this is attached to. Anyway, it's showing the BPF, uh, the BPF program that is attached onto your classic QDisk. Oh, nice. OK. Um, I... So um, the the pref and the chain are kind of and the handle are like the location where the BPF program is attached and the priority of the program. So if you have you can have more than one BPF program and they run according to their sort of priority and and handle. Um, is that describing where their location is in the tree? You mean? Yeah, I think so. But nice. I'm, I'm struggling to relate it back to the the IDs that are printed with the uh, the class app QDisk, but. Well, that's right. Well, you'll be you'll be pleased um, to hear that we're we're out of time anyway. So what we can do is, is <laughs> I, um, assuming, I think we'll probably will have this cluster up um, or a cluster like this one up next week, um, just to allow us to finish off the last couple of tiny. We've pretty much done what we wanted to on this cluster, but uh, there's one or two things. So we might come back to this uh, and see if we can dig into it um, in a tiny bit more detail. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably that's probably where we're going to have to wrap for today because we uh, otherwise we're going to overrun. Um, we've got two minutes, so is, if does anyone have any quick questions? Uh, and if not, uh, as usual, if if no one has questions which they feel comfortable asking on YouTube, that, that you can you can join us on Calico Users or Twitter or LinkedIn or any number of other places uh, and and ask questions there. Um, Sean's Sean and I are both engaged in Calico Users regularly, um, so we're very happy to speak to you. And if not, then um, Sean, was there anything else you wanted to cover off uh, today, or are you happy to to wrap and um, I, pick up next week? I think. I mean, just just looking at that command. I mean, the output it basically tells you the name of the of the program. So you've got Calico from workload endpoints is is our oh, internal nice. sort of uh, name. The the no log .o bit the suffix there. Uh, is the particular variant that we've applied. So logging is turned off in this BPF program. So we've compiled out logging for maximum performance. Nice. And the rest is the technical information about the program. So it's a direct action program. It's not offloaded to hardware. Certain yeah. types of BPF program can be offloaded. The ID lets you look it up in, uh, if you want to sort of dump its instructions and that kind of thing, you mm. can you can dump it with BPF tool, um, which we rarely do. but but you can do that kind of thing. Fantastic. And the tag is just a hash of the program. So yeah, that's that's it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Command, really. Brilliant. Nice. Um, I'd like to know more about that, not in hardware, but I think we'll pick that up later on. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, 
let's leave it there for today. Um, I think that was that was really good. I actually enjoyed that. Um, I think there was quite a lot of detail that I learned a few things. So I'm sure I'm sure that everyone else watching will have done as well. Um, so yeah, we'll wrap there. I think. Um, thanks so much, Sean. I appreciate as always. I really really appreciate your time um, um, doing this with me. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Bye. Right